Why do I stand up here? Anybody? To feel taller. No. Thank you for playing, Mr. Dalton. I stand upon my desk to remind myself that we must constantly look at things in a different way. You don't believe me? Come see for yourselves. Come on. Come on. Just when you think you know something, you have to look at it in another way. Even though it may seem silly or wrong, you must try. Now, when you read, don't just consider what the author thinks. Consider what you think. Boys, you must strive to find your own voice. But the longer you wait to begin, the less likely you are to find it at all. Thoreau said most men lead lives of quiet desperation. Don't be resigned to that. Break out. Don't just walk off the edge like lemmings. Look around you. Welcome to Successful Dropout. This podcast is for the outliers, the innovators, the rebels, those that dare to dream and act on their dreams. I'm your host, Kylan Ginger. Join me as we find out what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed. What is up, Successful Dropouts? Get stoked because today on the show we have Jesse Elder. Jesse is a millionaire mentor, an improv philosopher, former MMA fighter turned entrepreneur, and also the author of The Upgraded Life and The Mind Vitamin Library, among other things. Without attending high school, college, or any other educational institution, Jesse's experience and perspective comes from a lifetime of focus on results, not theory. Now he mentors people from all walks of life on how to be happier, healthier, wealthier, and wiser. So Jesse, that's the intro I have for you, man, but tell us a bit more about yourself and what you do. Uh, apparently, Jesse likes writing about himself in the third person. <laughs> 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 yeah, man. Uh, really, just uh, very appreciative to have this this uh, connection with you. You're, you're, you know, when I was looking at at your website and some of the other folks you've had on, I've I've got some clients that I saw on the guest list. I've got friends that have been on your guest list, and it's really cool to, really? to see this this whole thing unfolding. Yeah, the the um, I think what's happening right now is people are actually just like waking up to the fact that this uh, thing that they bought, namely a collection of ideas that if you follow certain patterns, do certain things, you'll be successful. People are realizing it uh, not exactly the case. And so uh, whether somebody's listening to this and they're considering entering school or they're in school and they're experiencing some resistance, um, you know, maybe, maybe we can just, just inject some uh, contrarian source code into the conversation here so that we can eliminate some outdated modes of being and allow people to actually tap into their intuition, their inspiration, their adaptability, uh, which is the new currency, by the way. Uh, knowledge is, is actually becoming less important than intuition, inspiration, and adaptability. So maybe we can roll into that. It helps the people make a lot more money and be a lot happier while they're doing it. Absolutely. So uh, tell us, tell us your journey then to, to discovering that. Oh man, if, if, uh, I, I'll, I'll share some, some pieces maybe that, that might be relevant, but, um, quite frankly, man, the more that I work with people and the more that I see people in our community, uh, clients, the, I'm realizing that the stuff that happened in the past, whether it's my past or their past is actually increasingly irrelevant. And what we can do is we can give people some tools that they can start to tap into their own innate wisdom, which actually displaces all the noise whether it's from your parents, your teachers, you know, your, your, uh, I always had this question, your guidance counselor, high school guidance counselor. And I've never been a high school, so I never had a guidance counselor, but I always wonder, like, if you know so much about choosing an amazing career, why are you a high school guidance counselor? <laughs> it's just kind of my, kind of my question, but, uh, Good one. yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, you know, I, I, when I was a kid, I started doing martial arts, loved it. Um, really loved the fact that you know you could train, go from not knowing anything to some level of functional mastery, and you could do that in a matter of hours. You know, it didn't have anything to do with the calendar; it had to do with the clock. It wasn't how many weeks or months or years you've been training; it's how many minutes are you willing to be in the heat? How many you know? How many seconds are you willing to to over and over again apply the technique? and learn from your mistakes and calibrate very quickly. And I realized that, that the calendar had nothing to do with that. It was all about the individual's willingness to subject themselves to the intensity of that training. And uh, so, I, man, I just fell in love with that process. I fell in love with training, and I learned to, um, 
actually get addicted to training. And I started to find out that, man, what I did on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday was actually turning into results on Thursday nights when I would compete. And, uh, you know, I was a bouncer at this club. I was getting ready to open my, my martial arts school. And uh, they started having these fight nights every Thursday night on the dance floor. They would literally just like roll out the mat on the dance floor and they'd have people sign up to fight. No weight class, no time limit, no safety gear, and um, no rules. Like you could, you could headbutt somebody <laughs> if you wanted to. You could elbow somebody. Sounds like, uh, what's that fight club? It Sounds did. Sounds like a fight club. It was, it was exactly <laughs> like. And, uh, and my, um, my love for training intensified during that period because I, I began to see a lot of guys that would walk into the ring full of theories that they'd inherited from their instructor or, you know, that they, that they had just kind of trained on because that's what everybody in their class is training on. And they walked in full of theories uh, and they generally, generally got carried out because their theories fell apart the moment uh, they encountered reality. You know, the moment they're trained in a very classical technique, which in the rules of the dojo, or the rules of the of your school, you know, everybody just unconsciously followed those rules. You know, like if you fall down, yeah. you stop the fight, let the other person stand yeah. up. That's an unconscious, uh, an unconsciously accepted rule. But in this kind of thing, if you fell down, the guy just jumped on you and started punching you. And I watched guys m- just go through this very quick uh, wake up call when they were laying on the, you know, they'd slip or they'd get taken down and you'd immediately see them like, look at the referee. There, there was a guy, he wasn't the referee. His job is to keep the speakers intact so that when the fight got too close <laughs> to the speakers, he'd push these guys off the speakers like, hey, don't damage our sound system. But he wasn't the freaking referee. And I, and I watched, I'll, I'll never forget the look on these guys' faces when they would go from walking in with tons of confidence, absolutely convinced that their training was the best, their style was the best, you know their 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 skills were the best, and 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 in a matter of seconds, realize that a their skills aren't useful, uh, b they are now in very real danger, and c there is nothing that they have anywhere mentally, emotionally, physically, nothing that they have in their arsenal to be able to deal with it, and and these are the guys these are the guys that whether we get carried out, and uh, you know I I don't, I don't want to. I'm not trying to make it sound like I'm a violent person. I'm I'm not violent, but I just realized very quickly the difference between theory and results. And so all of my training went to, to results, and I started training jujitsu. You know, there's not a lot of people still back then that were doing it, and and um, you know, very quickly I learned to embrace this results only philosophy, and I won. I, I ended up winning, and then I won again, and I won again, and and won most of the matches that I competed in, not because I was bigger or stronger. Uh, because I just had different training. And so, you know, I just, I see this continue to play out with people. I mean, frequently I'll have clients that will come to me and say, I've got an MBA or, uh, you know, I, I had a very successful sales job, you know, in this big company, but now I want to do my own thing and the skills aren't translating. And so it's almost like an unbrainwashing that we have to do so that you can tap back into your innate wisdom using skills that are readily learnable like marketing and sales or or uh or writing or or whatever it is um and bottom line is man that that uh level of self-trust is always there it's never not there we've just been so taught to ignore it uh, at least until you get the grades get the job get the girl get the guy get the house get the mortgage get the get the get whatever and then then what then you've got a freaking lifetime of ignoring your own intuition and then you're screwed so I, I say my, my particular um, f- uh, flavor of philosophy would be test, 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 test. And I don't claim that anything that I teach is the truth. I've stopped caring what's true a long time ago, and I just started asking what's useful. And I'll use something and apply it until it is no longer useful, and then done, delete it, displace it, replace it with something more effective, and those more effective solutions are always there. Hmm. That's fantastic, man. So tell me, um, tell me that journey to decide. Did, did you ever think about going to college at all, or was just never even uh, 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 an option for you? I thought about. It. Yeah, I, I, I did think about it. I, I thought not about going, but I thought about you know what that what would that be like, and it um, didn't appeal to me. It didn't didn't interest me. Um, 
my path was martial arts and I, you know, I had found the thing that I, um, love to do, which was teach and train and teach and train, and compete and teach some more. And I just thought, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So when I was 17, I told my parents, this is what I want to do. And they said, we're sure they were supportive. Yeah. Yeah. They said, yeah, sure. You'll figure it out. And if you decide not to, you'll find something else. Yeah. And so then from there, you went out to actually create quite a successful business, correct? Uh, yeah, we did okay. Um, I after those uh, those days as a bouncer and and doing those fights, I had a couple of private lesson students. You know, I take the bus to their house or you know take. I, I eventually I had this this like beat up you know a Mazda RX seven. Like I thought it was the coolest car ever, but um, I would I would drive to their house, teach them in the mornings, and then event, eventually ended up teaching at a fitness center in uh, San Antonio. And I was teaching in the little this little back room at this at this uh, gym. And built that up to, to a few students and then ended up finding a location and signing up, uh, you know, signing a lease and opening up and uh, realized very quickly that nobody actually cared uh, how good of a teacher I was. <laughs> they didn't care how good of a martial artist I was and they sure didn't care how many fights I'd been in. Um, none of that translated. So I had to learn pretty quickly how to communicate uh, not the benefits of what I was doing, but learn to see what it was that people were going through uh, that I might be able to provide a solution to. And this is, this is why, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of really smart broke marketers out there. Um, mm. You know, very smart. They know a lot about marketing. They know a lot about copy about, you know, manip- manipulating the limbic system and, and using, you know, wordsmithing and all of this stuff. And that's great. Um, but man, if you want to, if you want to make a lot of money really, really quickly, just look for, look for people who are in pain and learn to speak their language, learn to tell the story that's going on for them in their own mind. And uh, so I did that. You know, I realized parents weren't coming because they wanted their child to have confidence. Most, most people can't even define confidence um, very effectively for themselves, let alone do a Google search for how to develop it, let alone stumble upon you know, my karate school. So that's too much, too much men- mental heavy lifting, right? So I just realized, well, what are they, what are they, not what do they want, what are they dealing with? What are their problems? And I realized that, wow, you know, kids are being di- diagnosed with ADD and ADHD at record numbers, and the parents are then going straight to the doctor who's prescribing Ritalin or Adderall or some other bullshit like that. And not saying that that's not a valuable tool at times, but when it's the default and you're not even looking at alternatives, man. Uh, so I realized that this is the pain point, is that their child's got this diagnosis of ADD or ADHD. Um and it wasn't even the diagnosis that was the issue. It was the fear of the future. It was the, you know, how do I love my child through this without making them feel like a weirdo or like an outcast and still have harmony in our house and still have their, them do their chores? Like that was the pain point. How do I stop arguing with my spouse who just wants them on Adderall and I want to explore alternative things? How do we end that argument? And so I realized that those are the issues that I was in a position to solve. So I made some signs up. And said, uh, uh, if your child's been diagnosed with AD, or parents of, of uh, children with ADD or ADHD, don't even consider researching any more alternatives until you click here. And we would have a little website, and they would go to the website, and it would just be explaining, like, we found this, this strange behavioral technique that helps. And then they'd call my school, and we'd get them in there. And we signed up tons of people, <laughs> not positioning martial arts, but providing a non-pharmacological approach to behavioral, um, you know, to these behavioral issues. Next thing you know, 30 minutes later, these kids have their chest out, chin up, they're bowing, they're looking at their parents saying, yes, I can. And we say, what does a black belt do? And they say, sir, a black belt cleans his room without being told, sir. Oh my gosh. And these parents are like, what the heck is this? And then I'll say, here's the program. Uh, if you'd like to continue, this is how it is. And we were selling seven, $8,000 memberships because oh it wasn't about punching and kicking. That's insane. I, I love how you're so focused on just actually getting to the root of the the issue and the root of the growth instead of just slapping band aids on it. And I have a question. Well, for anything you. else is what's that? Yeah. Well, anything else is mental masturbation. <laughs> if we're just engaged in the process, the process, the process, the process. Um, you know, I, I work with a lot of coaches. I'll just make this part real short because I you probably have a lot of consultants and coaches or people who want to be coaches. Um, there's a difference between coaches that are making five thousand a month and those that are making five thousand a day, and the difference is um, the people who are chasing and trying to prove their worth 
Those are the ones that are generally experiencing uh, financial stagnation. Those that are clear about the result that they are there to, pro- uh, to provide, they can have a very simple, call it a sales conversation, enrollment conversation, discovery call, whatever you want to call it. And it really comes down to this. If, if you're a coach or a consultant and you're listening to this, next time a prospect comes to you and says, you know, I want information, just know that they're probably a collector of processes so that they can then go and think about it. Mm-hmm. Shortcut that and just say, if what you're more interested in is collecting lots of information, um, then I'm probably not the right person for you. The people that I love to work with are people who are really, really, really excited about getting results. And so if you'd like to talk about the results that you'd like to experience, or if you'd like to talk about some of the issues that you're now facing, I'm all ears. Um, But if you're more interested in collecting some ideas, I'm I'm probably not the right person Mm. for you. Interesting. And you'll you'll save time on your sales calls and you make a lot more money. I got another question that you might be able to shed some light on here. Um, A lot of the times the issue that students face when they're looking at possibly dropping out or or just stepping out of the system is, what do I do? And especially at that age, um, the the focus is really, a lot of people say that they go to college to discover and, and, you know, figure out what they want to do with the rest of their life and stuff. So what would you say are some practical steps at a younger age like that, that you can start to take to start um, defining your, your, uh, your uh, strengths, weaknesses, uh, your interests, and just kind of your general uh, per- discovering your purpose in life. Yeah. Um, I was very fortunate to have something that I already resonated with, and, and that was martial arts. Um, mm-hmm. what, I've, what, what I've advised lots of people to do, regardless of their age, but when, especially when you're considering the college choice, uh, again, you know, full disclosure, I can't talk about college having never been. So – you know, it may be the perfect thing for somebody. And if somebody's listening to this, you know, maybe, I, I don't know, you'll have to judge for yourself. Um, but absolutely give yourself lots of different experiences. And so, you know, going to, going to travel mm-hmm. and staying in hostels with, and not, not an attitude of consumerism or consumption. Um, you know, some people travel and they just really, they're just going for the selfies they're just going so that they can tag themselves in at all these badass places, and that's that's cool. Nothing wrong with that. Um, but if you want if you want your purpose to find you and you want to connect with your purpose, there's always an element of uh, giving and growing and gaining. So it's give and grow first. So I would, man, if I if I had it to do over again and I didn't have that thing that was pulling at me to do like martial arts or teaching, uh, fuck, man, I would just go on tour. I would go on a personal tour and I would stay in places with an, uh, an intention to give and to grow wherever I am. You know, Daniel Day Lewis, phenomenal actor, uh, actually lived in a village in Italy for something like two years in disguise and he worked as a cobbler, a shoemaker. Nobody knew who he was. He just worked as a shoemaker because he wanted to become that person. He immersed himself in that. And I would I would suggest somebody just drop in to some cool little place, find a uh, a, a community or find a hostel, uh, find an Airbnb, work odd jobs, drive Uber, just gain experiences with the intention to give and grow. And what'll end up happening is if you're going through this with eyes wide open and you're going through this um, with a real intention to get good at things, you'll start to put together dots and you'll start to make connections that other people don't have and then you either write about that or you share your experiences but more than likely what will happen is you'll be drawn to something that that speaks to you you'll find something you'll find someone or a group of people that are resonating uh, and who are actually doing what it is that you want to do well get around those people you know, do what it takes to be around those people. I mean, we've we've got so many people now that are moving to Austin because of the stuff uh, that that I'm up to and the stuff that I'm doing with my community and I'll, and this amazing group of people. Um, we're, they, they call themselves Arc Nation, uh, Arc. You know, like <sighs> like uh, accountability, results, and celebration. And it's just like this badass collection of alpha hippies who want to make a difference, who want to make money, and who want to live completely free. And <laughs> We have people that are moving to Austin or getting places here or getting places together because they want to be around that energy. And 
then they're doing their own thing. They're doing Amazon products business. They're doing, you know, odd jobs. They're starting dog walking companies. They're, um, you know, transplanting their consulting businesses. As long as we got Wi-Fi, man, Wi-Fi, wherever I'm feeling inspired, baby, that's what Wi-Fi is. <laughs> I like that. Um, I was talking to actually some of my friends last night. We were talking about the a lot of the times when you are searching for that purpose or that thing to pursue, um, people can have these kind of flash in the pan experiences with with uh, getting super passionate about something maybe for uh, a couple of weeks. Sometimes it's just a weekend if they go to like a workshop or mm -hmm. um, go through some coaching. You know, what do you think separates that kind of experience? Somebody's just kind of a flash in the pan, and a, and a week later they're back into their same old routine and not inspired versus somebody who may be on a, on a more steady, you know, uphill climb to uh, finding that happiness and that life purpose. What do you think is the difference? Uh, there? Yeah, I, I think the, the really Kyle on the biggest difference is uh, it's a, it's a, it's a very easy judgment to say, well, this is a straight trajectory and this is kind of haphazard. Um, and I, and I think that that's no pun intended, but I think that's a slippery slope philosophically. That we might see somebody that looks like they have a very clear path. Well, I did this, then this, then this, then this. Ta-da, here I am. Well, of course they're going to say that looking back because, you know, we all, you know, tell our own personal history from the place that makes us feel the best. Um, but who's to say? I mean, look at Jay Abraham, one of the, one of the top marketing guys in, in history. Well, the reason he is where he is is because he did all these other completely seemingly unrelated things. He had all these odd jobs and he was doing all these different things. And you could easily, in that moment, you could look at that period of time and say, man, there's no connection here. But given a long enough perspective, you know, if we really got, you know, go out to Google Earth perspective and we look at things from that place, then you start to realize that, wow, I see now the meaning and the benefit and the value that was in every single experience. And so uh, I would suggest just don't judge the journey. And if you're coming from a place every day of giving and growing, then gaining is the natural result. And even if it's just learning lessons, I mean, if you don't know how to make a great cup of coffee, learn to make a great cup of coffee. What will happen is then you engage your brain and then you start to think, well, how can I make that better? And then one thing leads to another. And that's what our brains do is just scour our environment for new stimulus. And so I wouldn't judge no. the, the seeming you know, disparity of it. So yeah, if you go to a seminar and you get all fired up, that's cool. Just remember that most seminars are designed to sell you the next seminar. So as long as you, you know, kind of keep, you know, keep your wits about you. Uh, a friend, friend of mine went to a very, very well-known, probably the most well-known personal development experience out there, three days, hot coals and everything. And I said, man, how was it? And he's like, yeah, I left the morning of the second day. He's like, yeah, not my thing. I'm like, good for you, man. And there's a lot of pressure in that environment. Like, don't quit. You got to, but dude, you know, you know what's right for you and you know what's not right for you. And if it speaks to you to do stuff like that, then do it and get and get mm -hmm. that high and get that experience and then experience, you know, the crash afterwards and all of that. Just go through it. Go through all of it. And eventually you have the opportunity to realize that you're not broken. You're actually completely indestructible. The past isn't real. Neither is the future. Because when you're thinking about the past, when are you doing it? You're doing it right now. When you're thinking about the future, when are you thinking about the future? <laughs> right now. Right and so now. the past and future don't exist. All that exists is right now. So the quality of your now absolutely prepaves and uh, reality is, is malleable. And you can hack reality. You can pre-render the scenery that's loading for you by getting really, really good at the present moment. Mm. Yeah, I can tell you one thing that I've recently discovered is that I find a lot of people get paralyzed because they're waiting for that idea, and then after the idea, maybe the inspiration to pursue it, and then they got to take action. Um, but what I found is that action begets action. Uh, if if you can yep. if you can if you can just take action on something that causes you to have more ideas and causes you to get inspired more. You know, people think of it as it's too linear, and it's more like uh, it's more circular in in my opinion. And it sounds like that's what yep. kind of you were touching on there a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're, I think you're really honest something there that, um, that experience of, of just, just collecting, collecting ideas, collecting experiences. That's all we're ever going to be doing anyway. 
Hmm. And, you know, can, we can do it with, you know, a begrudging attitude or we can do it with, you know, the best attitude we can, which is why it's important. Uh, like I'm not a, a fan of suffering. You know, I don't, I don't suffer. I don't, I don't, um, you know, I support people's right to suffer if that's what they want to do. Um, generally, you know, like a big part of my, of my deal is, is just pointing out the fact that suffering is a choice. Pain is not. Pain is a normal, natural part of life. But suffering is the judgment and the story that we tell ourselves about that pain. And um, I opted out of suffering a long time ago, and I decided that, um, that I only have two choices in my life. It, I'm either only going to do things that are awesome or that are fucking awesome. Like those are the two <laughs> two options. And if it's not one of those things, then I have nothing to do with it. I, I'd like to transition now into – I feel like that's a good transition into finishing out the rest of your entrepreneurial journey here. So you were telling us about how y- – you kind of built your first uh, couple dojos or or whatever, and then so how did you come out of that into where you are now? And then what are you what are you doing currently? Yeah, um, so yeah, that first school opened in uh, San Antonio on Northridge Military Drive. A couple of years later, we opened the second and third school, and I started training my students how to do the things that I was doing: how to recruit, how to sell, how to market, how to engage with the community, and. Um, you know, I just wasn't willing to subsidize people who just wanted to teach because I knew that, that then they weren't going to be self-reliant. So you know, if you want to be a teacher, you're only as good as your ability to attract new members. It doesn't matter how good of a teacher you are. The, the real mark of a teacher is how attractive are you to people that are completely ignorant. I don't mean that to be an insult, but they just don't know what martial arts can do. So all of my staff was, tr- was trained that way. And it, that allowed us to grow. Um, it allowed me to really stay focused on the vision, allowed them to enjoy teaching and recruiting and selling and all of that. Um, we had a lot of instructors who were making a lot of money. We had high school seniors who were making more money than their principal because they were based in a results economy, not based on academic theory or bureaucracy. And uh, so we built that up eight schools and had a consulting company where we were teaching other uh, martial arts instructors, how to do what we were doing. Um, two of them became partners. And so we ended up uh, growing that. And I was very blessed to have a, a great mentor, somebody who was in the business, who was further down the road. And so we collaborated uh, on everything and, and merged our organizations. It was, it was awesome. Like it was a great experience. And around 2010, I began to realize that there was a lot of, like there was just something in me that that I had to continue sharing that was uh Martial arts was no longer the vehicle for that. And so I began to share some of what I, what I was thinking and feeling entrepreneurially. I began to share some of my um, systems and my methodologies for recruitment and, and sales and um, service and creating experience for people. Ended up getting a couple of clients who weren't martial artists, and that was a big eye-opener for me, that people would actually pay for what I knew uh, who weren't martial artists, uh, right. that this skill, skill set would actually transfer over. And then I realized that, oh, it's not an industry thing. It's an individual thing. It's based on you know human the human OS. And I realized that my way of looking at things, I uh, say my way, like I didn't freaking invent it. It like, found me. Um, but I, I really saw logic as an app, not the OS. And so I realized that if I can just help divor- divorce people from their addiction to logic and figuring everything out before they – you know, put their heart into it, you can actually shortcut the entire system. Um, so I began to do that. And in 2010, 2011, had a couple of private clients. 2012, made the decision to sell the martial arts schools. So I sold the schools to my to my mentor, to my, my business partner. And um, 2013 was, was definitely a, a lot of growth. Um, four months after I sold the school, um, I, I uh, realized that my marriage was not the – is not what I thought it was or nor what I wanted. And so a few months after selling the business that I built up for you know, a couple of decades, um, I ended up uh, getting separated and then got divorced. And so that was in 2013. The income that was coming from the sale of the schools effectively went to go pay for the divorce. And so I was making about $3,000 a month. Um, had a couple of clients that I'm very appreciative of because one basically paid my rent, the other one paid my car payment, and that was it. And I just wasn't willing to hurry up and figure out how to do the marketing thing. I thought, I don't need anything. I can sleep on the floor. I can sleep under a bridge. I don't care. Like I'm creating my own happiness. I'm not reliant on the environment to make me happy. So I was sleeping on the floor. 
um, I told myself that I was sleeping on the floor to be super spiritual, but no, I was fucking broke. I didn't have any money. <laughs> That's why I was sleeping on the floor because I couldn't afford a bed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that was 2013, man. And then uh, and then I started, um, you know, just those couple of clients that I had. I just began really focusing on serving them, and uh, little by little, word kind of got out that hey, you should talk to Jesse. And then uh, one day, I got the idea to do this video on Facebook, and so. Um, you know, Facebook video was still kind of new back then. We certainly, wasn't, we weren't doing live or anything. But I had about 300 friends on Facebook, so I did a video and put it out there. Called it 70 Seconds of Mastery," and um, and in a week, that video got like 200 shares, which is far from viral. But for me, it was like, wow, really, really cool. So I started doing Facebook videos. A couple months later, rolled out this program called "The Upgraded Life." Um, that was a, the first, my first foray into being an online marketer. <laughs> and uh and the, yeah just continued from there so i moved to austin and uh lived downtown actually i'll show you the building that i lived in you can kind of kind of see it it's one of those, oh, one of those yeah. buildings downtown there um so yeah so i moved moved to moved to austin and um i just began uh running masterminds and running trainings and and so that's where I um, that's that's how things kind of ended up here. I, I started doing more uh, private coaching and and started offering private days. And you know people would invest 10k to fly in and spend the day together. And you know started started booking those a lot more. And um, now we've got this amazing team and this online community. It's got thousands of people. It's called Arc Nation, and um, it's it's an amazing amazing group of people. Huh. So I I know you don't suffer, but I'd love you to tell us what you'd consider to be your worst entrepreneurial moment to date. Worst entrepreneurial moment. Good Lord. I think that the worst moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's several, <laughs> several thousand. Um, but you know what? In the moment it's not suffering, you know, like, you know, when you're in the ring and you're losing, um, you, you, you know, like you're aware of the fact that you're losing the fight, but you're so in the moment that you just don't have a lot of emotion around it. You know, I, and I remember, um, I, I do remember a time that I, I had uh, one school that was doing doing really well. I think we we were we had taken our gross from like three fifty to seven hundred fifty thousand in one year, which for us was just like incredible. And um, and we were running one location. I had a couple of team members. Um, Everybody's making great money. Like people were paying cash for their cars, and just like it was, there was a lot of money left over. Uh, but I knew that if we were going to grow, we had to open more locations. So I decided, um, in, in retrospect, I realized this is probably a pretty impetuous thing to do, but I decided to open not one school, but open two right at the same time. Um, my thinking was that if I opened one school, um, then I would have, you know, my main school and I'd have another one that would, then I would just be running back and forth. And I knew that there, if, if I opened three, you know, two more locations, then I would be forced to systemize and become a better leader. And not, I could yep. jump in and, you know, save people, not that they needed saving, but I knew that's my tendency. So I opened two schools, mm -hmm. signed a lease uh, on each school within 45 days of each other, um, then realized that because I was not very good at negotiating leases, that I was responsible for the finish out of both schools and I would be reimbursed after the finish out, but I had to come up with the money for the finish out. And uh, that was a, right. that was a gut check moment. My, my office manager, Helen, came to me and she said, Mr. Elder, you know that... Uh, you know that you have to pay for the finish out, right? I was like, yeah, yeah, but they'll they'll reimburse us. And she's like, no, you have to pay for it first. It has to be done, and then they're going to give it to you. And the payment's like sixty days net. So, you know, you just basically you signed up for a lease. The lease kicks in. You're going to be on the on the hook for all this money. And uh, it was a gut check moment. And I just I just remember like swallowing my throat. Right. And I looked at her. and I said, how much money? She's like, it's a lot. And I said, a lot is not a number. I'm not going to get emotional about it. You can if you want to. If you're going to be emotional about it, I don't want to talk to you. What is the number? And she told me. It was like $74,000. And I was like, when is it due by? She said, you have to have the money 30 days from now. And I said, all right. Thank you. She's like, how are you going to do it? I got up. How, <laughs> how is not up to me? So I went and I meditated. I got chill. And I asked for you know, you tap into Cosmic Google when you when you're tapped into Cosmic Google and you understand how to meditate for power. Cosmic Google. Yeah, when you understand how to meditate for power and clarity, you have access to all the information that's ever existed. 
And when you can chill logic out for a little bit, and instead of going, how, 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 or what if, what if, what if, fuck that, like just chill out. When that, when you allow the answers to come to you, the right answer always shows up. So I meditated, got the right answer. It's like, all right, cool. Implemented it. Um, and we ended up making the money. We did um, 30000 on one project, which the numbers to me now, I look back and I'm like, how did that happen? Um, but it's, you only have risk if you entertain two or more paths. Because risk implies the more dangerous of, of two or more options. But if you don't have more than one option, if you literally only give yourself one option, then risk disappears because there's no more questioning. You know, it's like the, the, uh, the old saying, the, the, the person who wears one watch always knows what time it is. The person who wears two watches is never sure. And so huh. when you only have one course of action and you commit to that course of action, Sounds weird, but I've split tested the, I've split tested this paradigm over and over, and it never fails. When you absolutely commit to doing something, and you leave yourself no choice. The resources to fulfill the vision have to show up as sure as gravity, and that's what happened. So the scariness was in entertaining uh, the thought of not doing it. Once that thought was gone, and there was all that was left was the doneness of it in my mind then the actions uh, very naturally arise, the inspiration very naturally arises, uh, and you get to have fun with the whole process. Huh. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, Cortez burning the ships. You know, there's only one way, yep. gotta, gotta conquer. Yep. I can't tell you how many Pretty times cool. that's, that's helped me. Now, how about on the, on the flip side, more of an aha moment of your entrepreneurial journey, just a, a moment where something uh, clicked and it really just changed the, the course of events for you. Yep. The, the moment that I realized that being broke was a choice. Tell me about that. Where does money come from? And what are the answers that people think of, right? If you were to ask somebody, where does money come from? Like a job or? A job. What, let's let's play with something. It. Yeah, selling something. Where does money come from? Um, the universe, right? <laughs> uh, hard work, value creation, all those things. Yep. Um, I, I'm a homeschooled kid from South Texas. Uh, underground street fighter, and so I don't use a lot of fancy terms. So I don't really, I didn't really understand those things. As far as I was concerned, money only came from one place, and I still believe this: money comes from other people's bank accounts. That's where money comes from, and I'm happy to be proven wrong on that. But so far as I can tell, every dollar that any human being has ever received, right before it went into their account or their pocket. It was in someone else's account or someone else's pocket. So that being said, the only way you can run out of money is either to run out of people that you can serve and interact with or to choose not to serve and interact with them. Um, I don't think that the first picture is going to happen. I don't think we're running out of people. As a matter of fact, my understanding is there's more and more of us. So that leaves only one possible thing left, and that's to choose not to interact in a way that's, that's valuable. So uh, it really hit me. I realized that I was broke because I was choosing to be broke. I was choosing to not see things from people's perspective. I was choosing to be all about me. I was choosing to be focused on getting smarter and cooler and more accomplished and certified and all this stuff. None of that had anything to do with, with my bank account. So I began to really get curious about what, you know, why do people buy? You know, I began to look at my own life. Why was I buying? And I started to realize that, oh, there's patterns here. So um, that was a huge revelation for me. Once I realized that I can literally leave my school at two o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, I can go out for three hours, rain or shine, with a stack of guest passes, and I'm the only one who's deciding whether or not to go and approach that family at the mall and say, excuse me, have you got one of these yet? And they go, what is that? And I said, well, my name's Mr. Elder. I'm an instructor right here down at the, the uh, karate school. And the reason I wanted to meet you today is our school is giving away 30 days of martial arts for free. Have you ever taken martial arts before? And I would just go through this little dialogue that I practiced. And I realized that, wow, every, for every time I do that, or, or for every five times that I do that, two people will not say, no, thank you. Two of them will actually listen. One of them will actually set an appointment. And if I could schedule 10 appointments, five of them would show. And for all five that would show, I'd sign up four of them because the class was that good. So I just did the math and I thought, okay, each new student is paying this much. 
That means, and I just did the math backwards, and I, it worked out to I was getting paid something like $8.50 for every guest pass I gave out. So I just became immune to rejection. I thought, man, if I, if I want to go and make 800 bucks, I just got to go and pass out 100 of these things. That doesn't take very long. Huh. That's fascinating. What's a, a, a personal habit that you believe contributes to your success? Meditation, hands down. How, how, how do you meditate, just really quick? I mean, what does that I'll, mean? I'll, are, I'll you, are you listening try, to music? Or are you doing the whole cross your uh, legs? Like, <laughs> oh, 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 natural. There's a uh, there's a lot of ways to do it. We've we've actually got a great training on this. It's called Prime Light. Uh, the Prime Light meditation is a four phase meditation. Uh, the origins of which I learned when I was fighting and competing, and I had to do something to like calm myself down because I get so nervous before fights. And um, and I realized that that this um, the meditation actually has four phases to it. So the first phase is called presence, and that's where you allow your thoughts to just kind of spin themselves out. So don't move. Whether you're sitting down, lying down, doesn't matter. Um, but do the best you can not to move and just breathe. Uh, don't move, just breathe. Every time you move, you actually wake your brain up a little bit more. And that's why people fidget and they can fidget for an hour and they're never allowing their brain waves to settle down. So you never drop into the, to that. Uh, you never change your brain state. So phase one is presence. Phase two is active appreciation. This is literally just remembering backwards things, people, experiences that you appreciate and when you're doing that from a place of presence, it actually feels very good. Uh, you're not distracting yourself with different thoughts. Um, after active appreciation, you enter a space called prepaving. And prepaving is when you're riding the momentum of that active appreciation and you're beginning to feel forward into, you know, wouldn't it be cool if? And from this very non attached, daydreaming kind of a place, logic is chilled out. You're not screaming, how do I do it? You just allow yourself to envision it, and it's very subtle, but it's very powerful because this is how you're actually enticing the universe to deliver you those things, and how it delivers to you is in ideas. You get an idea. You get the impulse. You think of a person. That's how the universe manifests. It's not by dumping a Ferrari in your driveway, but by giving you an idea about what to do, and then the fourth phase is receiving. That's when you start to receive ideas. And so you do that four phase meditation consistently. And um, I mean, that's why I'm in this house right now. You know, I was in that that condo, and then I started feeling into what's next. And I thought, you know, I want to go big. Like I want to do something that's that's kind of, um, you know, not scary because I don't I don't believe in scaring yourself into success. I don't think that makes much sense. I think you should be nice to yourself. I think you should love yourself. But um, I got pretty clear that you know the the way that I was going to serve people. Uh, and the way that I was going to love myself was to be in an environment uh, that I really, really loved that I felt great about inviting people to. And so I began to, uh, you know, we, we used to do workshops here. That's called the lair. Okay. And uh, and then we've got this room here this is where the front, front piano action happens there. Okay. Um, but this whole this whole place started as an idea. And then the, 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 the method for um, actualizing this showed up. I mean, I didn't, I didn't have the money for this place, but where does money come from? Money comes from other people's bank accounts. And so all that I had to do is figure out how do I serve people? And then I got excited about it. And then I was like, fuck, man, this is going to be awesome. And in, in uh, two months, I had two really good months in business. Then I gave the realtor two months of uh, bank statements. And they said, oh, you're fine. You're, you're approved. And now here I am in the house. So when you when you listen for that, you know when you allow yourself the, the uh, when you allow yourself to get your logical mind out of the way and you tap into that innate wisdom, it's always the right answer. Hmm. Cosmic Google, baby. So wh where can people go to find out more about this on on your website? Uh, yeah, they can go to jessielder.com. Uh, or really, the best place is is the. Um, the online community, uh, our nation, we run a seven day challenge, um, that quite frankly, just kind of weeds out people who are, who are, um, collectors of information because mm. the seven day challenge is, is no joke. I mean, it, it will change things. Um, people report ridiculous results that just seem like miraculous. It's so freaking consistent. They're making more money. 
uh, they're having like the best sex of their lives, which is strange because then, you know, when you, when you actually love yourself and you accept yourself fully, um, then you don't have anything to hide. Then you can actually express who and what you actually are, which is light and love in human form. Uh, so yeah, sex gets way better. You may, you start, uh, I said the money part, people are quitting jobs. People are leaving toxic relationships, not combatively, just very naturally. So uh, I would say if somebody's on Facebook, just go to uh, Jesse Elder's seven day arc challenge, or just follow me on Facebook. And uh, we're doing a lot of stuff on Facebook right now. And that would be a really cool way to come in. There's, there's uh, the challenge is a, is a neat group of people. Uh, and then we also have a, um, a, a Facebook community for, uh, for arc nation. You know, this, this group that's really about accountability and results and celebration and um, and it's a badass group. It's it's a group which is really dedicated to new beginnings, and uh, it's a bunch of alpha hippies, man. So if somebody's inspired to to jump in there and have a lot more fun with life, then uh, we'd love to to invite you to check it out. Love it, Jesse. Um, do you read? And if so, what's a, a book that you'd recommend to us? Um, yeah, I don't read that much. Um, I'm very inspired by reading the transcripts of the meetups and the, you know, the, the, the classes that, that we do online, because so much, this is really, um, so much of it is, is crowdsourced in the original sense of the term. You know, the, this material is really a collaboration between me and the members of the community. It's not like I've got some, you know, secrets of the universe that I'm going to sit in some special chair and, you know, impart the wisdom, yeah. um, but it is very, very, very powerful. And so I listen to those transcripts and I listen to people's questions and I hear the way that they are dialoguing with each other. And, uh, that's very, very powerful. So as far as recommendations, um, I could probably, I mean, if somebody had a topic, I would, I would probably recommend somebody that I know who's either a client or a friend who's world class in that area. You know, if you want to learn how to do, um, you know, video marketing, for example, and if you want to make viral videos, which, um, you know, sadly we've not been able to do yet. We actually haven't done any, but I'm sure they will be viral when we make it. But if somebody wants to make viral videos, um, go to my friend, um, Chris Stoikos and Alex Brown, the guys that started Dollar Beard Club. And watch their videos and like go to their go to their events and see what they do. Um, if you're into AI and uh, you know genetics and robotics and all that stuff, uh, this guy Walter O'Brien is uh, very. He, he he messaged me actually on my birthday. He said, "What's up, hippy dippy?" <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Walter is a very interesting dude. Uh, CBS show Scorpions is named after him. Um, and he's got this really interesting way of looking at the world. So if you're into AI and genetics in the future, like Walter's your guy. Yeah. So I'm, I'm more about recommending people rather than books, but <clears throat> I don't know if that helped, but that's no, I'm that's at. awesome. Thanks. <laughs> so I, I, we're running out of time here. I want to last, ask the last two questions, uh, here. And the first one is what parting piece of advice do you have for any of our listeners who are thinking of dropping out of college, but they haven't quite made that step yet? Yeah, uh, it's a different, uh, it's a uniquely personal decision. You know, the decision to opt out of something that is so culturally supported, um, you're going to face resistance. And if you are doing it to please somebody else, um, then I would rather than, than, you know, quitting or, or dropping out, I would just really look at, uh, your own need for approval. If you really need approval from other people in order to feel happy, and a lot of people do, uh, then I would say don't drop out. You know, don't don't drop out because you're going to face a lot of resistance. And and if that if it's important for you to be liked, and it's important to have your parents or your friends, uh, you know, or the fraternity or the sorority that's courting you, or or you know, if you just want to you know be at the games and you know you want to be wearing a shirt, that's cool and that's a great experience. Then go have it. Uh, but if you're more drawn to to do, being with people who are creators, not participants. If you're more, uh, if you hang out more with the kids that don't seem that cool, but are way more interesting, um, then then it's probably the right thing to do. And you'll start to see people, whether it's Arc Nation or listening to this podcast. Uh, there's so many resources out there now. Uh, just get busy, you know. Just get out there. And next thing you know, you're going to meet friends who dropped out, or you know, like me that never went. Or like, dude, are you kidding, man? Fuck college. Like, you don't need that. Um, and then there are people who would say that I'm an absolute heretic, uh, which I wouldn't uh, deny. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, how about for uh, any of uh, people out there who have already opted out or dropped out, any parting piece of advice for them? Um, yeah, it's, it really comes down to three things. Um, if you want, if you want to really enjoy your life, just tune into three things. And this is like a Venn diagram. One, two, three, you want the sweet spot. Yeah. So number one is the things, things that you really, really love to do. Do those things more. Give yourself time every day to do the shit that you love to do, whether or not it makes you money, whether or not there's anybody else involved, do the things that you love to do. Um, that's number one. Number two, find out what it is that you're really good at it and devote time to your craft. Dedicate that time, that mat time, the, the, the clock time, not the calendar time. Well, in six weeks, I'm going to be – no, not in six weeks. You're going to be six weeks older. That's it. <laughs> but you want to get good at something? Dedicate Monday from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. to doing that thing and only that thing. And when you find yourself checking Facebook, start your time over again because you just fractured your focus. Mm. Dedicate time to functional mastery of your chosen craft. And when you feel like you want to quit, great, quit. Go be mediocre. But if you want to dive through the veil of that, that quititude and you feel like quitting, go through it, man. Go through it. And then quit after two hours. Dedicate time to a craft, whatever that is. That's number two. And third is what is it that people are suffering from? Where is the problem that people have that you can be in a position to solve? And so the sweet spot is when you are solving people's problems with something you are insanely good at that you love more than anything. And when you do that, not only do you never work another day in your life because the work itself is so inherently pleasurable, you're getting better all the time because you're really good at it and you can't help but get better. And people will pay you ridiculous amounts of money for simply being yourself. <laughs> That's the sweet spot. Love it. Now, you mentioned a couple of things before, but again, what's the best way that people can connect with you? Uh, right now, Facebook is the best place, and, and for the foreseeable future, uh, we're investing pretty heavily in virtual reality, and we're going to have some amazing experiences for people to really connect with each other in this community once Oculus comes online. Uh, when people come here to the house for live trainings, we usually just put them upstairs in the Vive, and they meditate with the blue whale, and they're shooting robots, and then we actually do a meditation after that that helps them understand how their actual reality is uh, is just as hackable. So... Um, best places on Facebook and go to, uh, Jesse Elder. I mean, that's me. And, um, or look up, uh, Jesse Elder's seven day arc challenge. Our next, next one. Uh, we, we, we generally run those every two to three months. Fantastic, man. Well, successful dropouts. You've been hanging out with Jesse and Kylan, learning what it takes to drop out, grind and succeed. For everything we talked about today, head over to SuccessfulDropout.com and type Jesse into the search bar and the show notes will pop right up. And as always, stay hungry, stay foolish. For more information about how to drop out, grind, and succeed, go to SuccessfulDropout.com. I also love questions. If you have a question about anything we talked about today, I want to hear from you. Go to SuccessfulDropout.com and click the Ask Me a Question link at the top of the page. Successful dropouts. If you could go to iTunes and leave a positive rating and review, it would help the show out a lot. I know you're busy. I know you got a lot going on. But if you do that, it helps this podcast rank. It helps other people listen to it and gain value just like you have been. Thank you so much in advance.